Hello and welcome to Fintech Insider Insights. I'm Kate Moody, Customer Strategy Director at Lambda Fest. On this week's show, we're going to talk about FedNow. In July last year, the Federal Reserve launched FedNow, a new instant payment service promised as the biggest update to the US central bank system since the 1970s. When it launched, we released a podcast asking whether or not FedNow would flop. So one year on and with 800 financial institutions signed up, has it flopped or has it not? Or is it just still too early to tell? To find out, I'm joined by a great panel of guests. So first up, it's a welcome return to my colleague and LMFS guru of all things tech, Dave Morris, Global Head of Technology. Um, Dave, obviously we chat a fair bit, but you know, tell our listeners how you're doing, what you've been up to recently. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, some really interesting things going on at our end at the moment. Lots of really interesting payments things. Not thinking the US payments wise at the moment, um, but lots lots around the, the world in, in the Middle East and different areas, which is really, really good fun and interesting. Keeping you busy for sure. Um and it wouldn't be a FedNow episode of FinTech Insider without our next guest. So we are delighted to welcome back to the pod uh, Stephanie Kirkpatrick, founder and CEO of Aurum. Stephanie, welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure to have you on. How are you? How are things, Aurum? Kate, it's so great to be here. Thanks so much for having me back. Um, for those who may not know me, I'm Stephanie Kirkpatrick, uh, founder and CEO of Aurum. We provide the simplest API for fast, reliable payments and instant bank account verification. And so what that means is we provide the technology required to remove today's constraints around the movement of money. We unlock access to all major payment rails, including RTP, but now same to ACH, ACH wires and more. And Kate, it's been a really busy and exciting year since we last chatted about FedNow. As you know, we launched our Verify product on top of FedNow, and then we most recently launched a no-code version of that solution. So later in the show, I'll be looking forward to talking about all of that. And it's just great to be back. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you very much for making the time and very much looking forward to picking your brains as per always. Um, and completing our lineup, we have Sam Ahrens, co-founder and CTO at Modern Treasury. Welcome to the show, Sam. Um, busy person, as well as your role at Modern Treasury, you are also a FedNow steering committee member. So would you mind telling our audience a little bit about yourself and, and what you do at Modern Treasury, please? Yeah, thanks for having me, Kate. Um, yep, my name is Sam Ahrens, co-founder and CTO of Modern Treasury. For those of you who don't know, Modern Treasury is a payment operations platform. We build tools to help people move, track, and reconcile money. Um, in addition to being CTO and co-founder, I usually say I'm a resident payments nerd. So I love talking about payments, love talking about FedNow. I was on uh, one of the FedNow working groups for reconciliation. So I gave a little bit of my feedback during that process. And uh, yeah, excited to see some of my, some of my feedback incorporated into the final product. Uh, so yeah, we're really kind of uh, working with FedNow and taking a look at how we can evangelize FedNow further in the market. Awesome news. Well, yeah, nerds very much welcome on on this show in the payment space and anywhere in the world of fintech. So yeah, very, very much welcome and looking forward to getting your perspective. So um, yeah, thanks very much for all of you for joining us. Let's let's dive in. So in the first part of the podcast, what we're going to do is we're going to recap, I suppose, what, what FedNow is in case any you you guys have been immersed in it for the last year, but maybe some of our listeners haven't been. Um, look at how it's been used and the impact it has had on payments in the United States so far. So Sam, maybe let's kick off with you. Would you mind giving our listeners, I suppose, a, an initial brief overview of, of what FedNow is and how it works? Yeah, absolutely. So FedNow is a new payment system. It's been around for about a year at this point. Uh, a new payment system in the US that allows 24-7, 365 payments that complete end-to-end -end in about 10-ish seconds. So it really is instant, especially compared to some of the more legacy payment systems that we have in the United States. Um, and it's essentially run by the Federal Reserve, um, who put out a system that is similar to a system put out by the Clearinghouse called RTP, which stands for Real-Time Payments. The Clearinghouse launched that a few years prior. But FedNow is sort of the Federal Reserve's take on the payment system. And it's very similar, this is what I tell people all the time, very similar to other systems that other countries have and had had in some cases for a decade. Uh, you know, faster payments in the UK is one of those that I like to shout out quite frequently. And it's very similar to those systems that are the instant sending of funds uh, between two accounts. Awesome. No, that's a great, a great intro. Um, and I suppose what were the what were the main things that you think the Fed wanted to achieve with the rollout of FedNow? Like what were the kind of chief, chief goals that you think they had? It's hard to say because uh, I'm not on the Fed, but if I were to kind of as an outsider, give my perspective, I would say that one of the reasons the Federal Reserve launched FedNow was uh, looking at the market and saying, hey, 
every other developed economy has this equivalent of a real-time system. Lots of developed countries have these real-time payment systems. Anyone in those systems who participates can send money between each other instantly. We don't have that in the U.S., or we do have that in the U.S., but it's run by private companies or it's closed-loop systems such as Venmo or Cash App. And so I think the Federal Reserve surveyed the landscape, potentially saw the maybe not as great uptake that RTP received on its launch and decided, hey, something has to be done. Let's launch uh, FedNow into the marketplace and see if it can gain traction. We're very unique in the United States in that for every payment system we have, we have one sort of run by the private industry and one run by the public industry. And internally at Modern Treasury, I always say one public, one private. So for the ACH system in the U.S., we have Fed ACH and EPN run by the Federal Reserve and the Clearinghouse, respectively. For wires, we have Fedwire and CHIPS, same thing, Federal Reserve and the Clearinghouse for the other. And for RTP, which was run by the Clearinghouse, for the longest time, we didn't have that public option. We didn't have that RTP-like system run by the Federal Reserve. And so I think the Federal Reserve also saw that as a potential gap in their offerings and decided, hey, let's close the gap and let's launch Fed now. And so now for every system that we have, we have one corresponding private-run system and one corresponding public-run system. Yeah, absolutely. As, a, as an outsider, that's one of the things that I find most fascinating about the US market is just, yeah, the balance between the private sector and the public sector. Um, Stephanie, I would love to bring, bring you in as well. So reflecting on what, what Sam's intro so far, what, what's your perspective? How, how well do you think the Fed have, have hit some of the goals that they may or may not have had when they rolled out this new platform? Well, as Sam said, it is such an interesting ecosystem in the US, I think distinct from other countries, in that we have tens of thousands of financial institutions, many of those, thousands of those are banks and in other countries, often that's not the case. So, you know, I think to reflect on the progress, the number of institutions in this case, a little over 800 institutions that are now signed up for and uh, using the FedNow's faster payment system, I would say in a very short period of time for what payments typically measures time by, it's an incredible success. And that doesn't mean that we're done with what will be the ultimate impact multiple years from now, even decades from now, and thinking about not only what faster and instant payments brought to the market, but even the simple concept of going away from a batch-based system like ACH, which operates essentially Monday through Friday with cutoff times, to a system like FedNow and its cousin, let's call it um, RTP, which can operate 24-7, 365. So we went from an era of payments a year ago where there were very few options to move money at night on the holidays on weekends to a, a place where now that exists. And I think what's so incredible about what the Federal Reserve has done with Fed now, um, in comparison to, say, RTP, which is a very similar type of system, is that the Fed has spent a lot of time getting smaller banks who don't have large technology budget, budgets to include the addition of this new rail and empower their financial profile, the offerings they have in market and their customer base with something that's incredibly important to both business owners and individuals. And I think the more that we think about faster and instant payments as a way to help communities fully participate in the financial system, the more we're thinking broadly about the impact that can be there when we begin to, and ultimately, I think over time, modernize the way payments work in the U.S., because there are so many differences here. Um, that said, there are still many challenges, right? One of which is interoperability. Uh, Sam, you gave such an incredibly good perspective on private versus public. The way I often describe it sort of in simple terms is, you know, when you go to ship a package, you have FedEx and UPS. So they basically go to all the same zip codes, but they're a little different and they're priced a little different and they behave a little bit differently. Um, and sometimes there's reasons why one system might suit the use case better than the other. And I think we're kind of finding that same thing to be true with FedNow and RTP. And thus, there's going to need to be, like Orem, like Modern Treasury, like many options in the market, technology that puts the two things together into a unified format. And so we're excited about the fact that with actually so few months, almost a year now passing, that there's been this much progress, because I think it just speaks to ultimately what's ahead for all things payments. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and Dave, yeah, we'd love to bring you in as well. What's What's been your take on the achievements or on or not such great achievements of the Fed now to date? Where's your Where's your perspective set? Yeah, I think it'd be easy to look from you know people who haven't worked in in the US space uh, and and you know I spent time working for Discover and things to look at it and go actually this is very slow. Um, and and that the numbers there can when you compare to the the sort of end game, um, you know, people will look and say there's this many institutions and only eight hundred and you know less than ten percent have got there, but it's never it was never about achieving a hundred percent. You can't compare it to to sort of you know what what would happen in the UK where it's very government and and regulatory driven um, where th- there's a sort of push to make sure things happen in a particular way. It's very much a, a market forces approach in the US to things. And people, people, you know, pick and choose what they think is the right thing without actually being pushed and, and mandated against it. So it's it's always good to think with that different viewpoint from that that you you would see in pretty much anywhere across Europe, um, which is very much sort of central driven from from that perspective. And it isn't about a, a sort of market forces approach uh, on that. Yeah, no, I think that's super interesting. Um, and Sam, I guess, whether you sit on the kind of positive side of the fence, like seeing 800 is a great number, or maybe the more critical perspective of like, oh, only 100, I suppose the next question is, what the, what, does the Fed, what does the Fed have to do next? And I think there's been some reports potentially about that interest maybe slowing, about it taking slightly longer now to onboard some of these, some of these organisations that want to move on to this rail. Um, have you sort of seen that from your perspective or what do you think the Fed needs to do to kind of either increase or maintain this momentum behind behind Fed now? Yeah, just on the initial momentum, I couldn't agree with Stephanie more. I mean, I think 800 banks in such a short amount of time is an achievement, especially, again, agreeing with Stephanie, considering the vast financial landscape that we find ourselves in the U.S. with so many different financial institutions and banks in particular to see where we are now one year in is, is I think, phenomenal. For that momentum, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily see it slowing on my end. You know, at Modern Treasury, you know, we're not a service provider for banks, we're a service provider for corporates. So I can really only talk about it specifically from the business perspective. On the bank side, we do see a lot more banks implementing FedNow and continuing their FedNow implementation. So I don't, I don't see any slowdown necessarily on that side. On the corporate side, on the businesses, you know, the actual users who will start using Fed now, we're seeing a ton of interest and that's kind of growing quite a bit, especially over the past year. I don't see any signs of that slowing down. I think one of the real main uh, issues in the market is, is education, is being able to get the word out that Fed now exists. You know, Fed now is relatively new. A lot of people are still writing paper checks in the U.S., and I know that's different from the U.K. by a, you know, by a mile um, or by a kilometer. But it's really, it's really different here in the U.S. Like payment systems don't die; they just change and morph into different use cases, and people hold on to the things that they really like and enjoy. And so, what I see more so than a momentum problem is really just a, an education and awareness problem. And the Federal Reserve's doing a fantastic job of reaching out to more banks and reaching out to more companies. Um, but that's also where Modern Treasury wants to help, is we, we, we want to shout FedNow's name from the rooftops because it's such an interesting, fascinating, and like business-improving system that a lot of people just don't know about it yet because it's not ubiquitous. It's only 800. A lot of those are still in implementation, but... No, I, I see the momentum swinging up. These things are going to take a while. I mean, we're not expecting to see progress overnight. These things of new payment systems usually take about a decade. Think of where Apple Pay was a year in. You know, maybe some big box retailers, but not everywhere, not ubiquitous. Not everyone had Apple Pay on their phones. And, you know, t- 10 years into Apple Pay, everything's wonderful and great. Um, and I think we're on the same trajectory for Fed now, and I don't think that's a bad thing. And so one year in to be where we are today, I think it's wonderful. No, I think that's that's very fair. And I love the point you make around that payment systems are not dying, right? Or like payment methods not dying. I think it's always been so interesting. You, you described yourself as a payments nerd. I would describe myself as a customer nerd. Whenever we speak to end customers in the US, I always find it so fascinating that there is just this completely different moment or moment of realization for US customers, I think maybe 
UK equivalents wouldn't have of almost choosing how to move money or, or kind of what choice to make. And I think that that doesn't really exist for many UK customers. I, I suppose, yeah, you might choose to send a payment through your bank or you might choose to send a check in very unusual circumstances, as, as you sort of set out. But people aren't sat there thinking, should I choose type A, type B, type C in the consumer space, maybe in the business space. But um, Stephanie, I suppose to continue nerding out about customers, I suppose I'd love to kind of think through how this has played out for end, end customers to date. Like, are we starting to see Americans on the street seeing the benefits of this? Has it got to that point yet or is it still in the implementation phase? I think it's very much gotten to a point where the American wallet, businesses and consumers are feeling the impact. But I would say that likely it would be true that anybody receiving a faster payment is unlikely to say, oh, that one came from FedNow and this one came from RTP. Probably not dissimilar from an Amazon package arriving at my front door. I care very little, did it come via UPS, FedEx, Postal Service, Amazon, believe it. I mean, there's so many ways, right? What I care about as an individual is how fast and how reliable is it? And that's what I apply to payments. So there are many forms in the U.S. of digital payments that can be done in what I'm going to call T plus zero. They happen today. Some happen in 15 seconds. Some happen in 30 minutes. Some happen before close of business. And what I find is probably going to be true is that other than something like Apple Pay, which people have a branded experience around, Faster payments in general, which system it was, isn't going to matter nearly as much to the end recipient. What they're going to care about is, does the financial provider that they got a product from, or does the invoice payment for their business from a software service come with instant capabilities? And so it's going to be incumbent on technology providers to continue to add the capabilities to orchestrate and optimize things like speed, risk, cost you know, reversibility, which in many cases isn't part of the um, FedNow system, to think about how to best transact given the type of request that's being provided by the consumer or the business. So while I do think we're seeing incredible impact already, um, and in fact, we have an incredibly interesting couple of use cases here at Orem where a variety of vendor payments and factoring payments and loan payments can go out instantly, I would hearken to guess that if we called up the end recipient, they would think about the software company or the business they worked with, not the underlying mechanism. And so us payment nerds, right, like Sam and I and Dave, love to talk about these sp specific details. But I think if we zoom out and just say, imagine a world five to 10 years from now where every single payment can be digital and every single payment can run 24-7, 365. And for a you know, slightly higher price, you can make sure that it's not reversible, that it gets to the person in 15 seconds. That's where the interesting piece comes, because I think then what we manufacture and distribute in financial services will likely look very different because the gating factor won't be how long till the check arrives or how much ACH return risk is there from Braggy. So it's just, I think, transforming us. Um, and I love studying the various use cases that today have gotten traction, everything from insurance payouts to you know, consumer wage payments and things like that. And I think there's a whole host of things coming that we've just not even scratched the surface on. I think it's, it's interesting. In, so many people who are in the payments world think about it from a very technology perspective and, and things and, and don't always step back. And there's so many times I've been at, at various conferences and, and seminars with, with people from the payments industry who don't step back and think about the customer. You know, the reality in the US is people don't have an expectation yet to see things coming that quickly. You know, it's starting to come and become more, more ubiquitous, you know, if you would talk to, to customers in the UK, you expect your payments to arrive instantly. You know, and as that expectation starts to grow and things like that, I think it will have to be more ubiquitous. And and the, and I think that will force the momentum on some of the uh, the institutions who haven't gone yet to to actually catch up because people will start to move from that expectation that there is today that well, it'll probably it'll be sometime today, sort of thing, to you know, why is it not here now? Um, and as people expect that more and more, then that expectation rises. Then, then people will have to have to get on board and and, and really be taking the, these solutions very seriously and moving quicker than they are now. You know, I imagine that you know somewhere it's on a list of things to do. You know, and the trouble is for for any of the banks who who are looking at doing this, they'll start with the things that have deadlines. Um, and it'll be a piece of regulation or something that has a deadline. 
you know, they'll be working on that. And, and unfortunately, for a lot of banks, they can't think holistically about these different things. They ran as programs of work. And, and they go on a train and the next one comes up and the next one comes up and eventually this will run to the front of the train for them and, and they'll go for it. But things keep jumping in, whether it's, you know, PCI 4.0 or other things, but yeah, they, they don't look at those things in that way because, you know, they could easily sit there and say, well, we need to make a change for Fedwire to, to move to the new, uh, the new technology there from the ISO messaging side of it. We could actually join this up and do Fed now at the same time because there'll be a lot of similarity of things that we need to change there. Banks don't think that way. Yeah, I suppose just to round out this section, I suppose, and build on Dave's maybe slightly more... I don't want to use the wrong adjectives, but yeah, like understanding maybe some of the challenges of of, of this change. Um, Sam, we've spoken very positively about the success of Fed now to date, but if we're being if we're being critical, what do we think are some of the main challenges that are still left to be fixed? You know, I was particularly interested to see some of the stats around maybe the different types of signups that we're seeing, you know, different institutions signing up to use Fed now for payments versus you need know, to receive payments versus to send payments. You know, what are the challenges that we're starting to see in people adopting Fed now and also how people are choosing to use it once they've adopted it. Yeah, I mean, we don't, you know, I think like Stephanie said, we don't have a brand. Uh, you know, consumers don't really look at the brand of what kind of instant payments they received. They just want to receive their money instantly. Um, and so one of those things that I would like to see more of is sort of giving the power to consumers to send FedNow payments or to send instant payments. It's, it's really interesting what you said, Dave, that there's a growing expectation of, of instant payments in the U.S. But I think consumers have that expectation today when it comes to peer-to-peer -to -peer transfers because Venmo 10 years ago set up that expectation. And now every consumer in the U.S. has this expectation of, oh, if I pay my friend, it happens instantly. But if my insurance company gives me a payout, I get a check in the mail, you know, 14 days later. And so there's this weird sort of bimodal distribution of like, if it's peer to peer, it's instant. If it's a business sending me money, it's not. And I think that expectation is what needs to change and grow. And so I think one of the ways you do that is you sort of, I would like to see institutions offer the ability for consumer to send a FedNow payment to another consumer. And then very quickly, add that ability for small businesses to send FedNow payments to consumers. Like, I see this future of anyone being able to just log into their banking portal, enter in their, you know, account routing number for someone else and be able to just send a payment instantly out of their bank account. And then from that, we can get small businesses paying consumers, we get consumers paying small businesses, consumers paying each other. But then it starts training this idea of like, hey, there is an instant system, it works, all I need is this. There's, of course, some practical matters to that account and routing number, a little bit outdated. A lot of people expect QR codes nowadays, so there's an interfaces challenges that's happening. But yeah, I think for getting more consumers on board and getting that expectation higher, I would want to see the interfaces being exposed to more and more customers directly, rather than how ACH is exposed to all of us, which is we give an outside party our account routing number and they do all the magic with it. And we as a consumer are sort of passively receiving stuff. I would like to see Fed now treated more like at the banks, more how Zelle is, where it's an integrated part of the experience that consumers and businesses alike can both initiate payments. Well, Sam, I think you touched on something interesting in the US that is not true, let's say in the UK, which is push payments in general is not how we've structured our ecosystem. And so if I want to, even in my own life, transfer money between a bank account my husband has at a different bank and the bank account that we share where we do our finances, we often have to write checks back and forth because consumers infrequently have like really robust wire capabilities and push payments really don't exist for us. Software companies can do that. Corporates can do that, but the everyday household or even small business owners often really limited. So it's just so interesting, right? Thinking about streamlining sort of how it happens and starting to think about the interface, the experience, the technology layer that users are going to interact with. So they can say, send Sam money. I owe him $10. Do it instantly, right? And not have to worry about all the underlying ways it could get done. But this kind of weird part of the American system where push payments is so far behind is, I think, another piece of the adoption criteria that we have to spend some time thinking about normalizing in terms of our behavior. Yeah, and just on this topic about 
push payments being strange for us, like pull payments are also strange for us. I mean, our ACH system, again, we just give out our account and routing number. There's no electronic mandate system the way there is for SEPA and BAX. There's no verification. I just see money leave my bank account and there's a huge amount of protections for me. You know, there's Reg E, there's the NACHA rules. I have 60 days to call up my bank and reverse a transaction. So there's all these recourses available to me as a consumer. But at a technical level, it really just is you pull money out of my bank account. And if I notice, then I can change it. Otherwise, like there's no technical instruction. You can just pull money out of anywhere. So we in the U.S. have these kind of strange approaches to things that work for us. And we've built a large body of law and very regulation around. But by and large, we, yeah, we sit in a different space. And I think Fed now is a good opportunity to pull us more in alignment with what other locales do because we see the benefits there. Awesome. On that note, I think that's a great place for us to pause because in the next section, we're going to dig even deeper into the opportunities for Fed now moving forwards. So we're going to take a very quick pause here for a quick break and then we'll be back really fast. So don't go anywhere. Whether you're starting or scaling your company security program, demonstrating top-notch security practices and establishing trust is more important than ever. Vanta automates compliance for ISO 27001, SOC 2, GDPR and more, saving you time and money while helping you build customer trust. Plus, you can streamline security reviews by automating questionnaires and demonstrating your security posture with a customer-facing trust center, all powered by Vanta AI. Over 7,000 global companies like Atlassian, Flow Health and Cora use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. Our audience gets a special offer of $1,000 off Vanta at vanta.com forward slash insider. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com forward slash insider for $1,000 off. Welcome back to Fintech Insider Insights, where we're talking about the first year of FedNow. In this half of the show, we're going to look ahead and discuss what we think the future might look like. Dave, I mean, just before the break, Sam, Stephanie, we're, we're talking about maybe some of the challenges, some of the things they want to kind of see change in the future. What are you excited about? Um, yeah, I, I think seeing push payments in the US is is going to be a big change, and you know, and, and it starts to align what they're seeing in the banking world to what they're used to in the sort of uh, you know account to account on peer to peer side. You know, that's not all as rosy as you think, though, and it's not straightforward. You know, in the UK, we we used to push payments, but there was a massive amount of fraud associated with that and that needs to be really fought through and made sure that that's actually becomes ubiquitous as part of those those payment networks um if those things are going to really be successful um you know you, you look at the, the the you know the stats in the uk are, are just crazy on, on on fraud yeah i suspect we'll be touching on fraud a little bit in this section because i guess you can't talk about innovations in payments without also talking about innovations in in fraud as well um stephanie i suppose one thing we again we talked in the first half of the show about the positives of the adoption curve we've seen with FedNow. There are obviously several of the US's top banks that haven't adopted it to date. Do you think that's going to change in the future? Is that going to have a significant impact on like the future trajectory of, of this platform or this way of paying? Well, it's an interesting question. I think it kind of goes back to like the top of the show in which we talked about the fact that there are so many different kinds of financial institutions in the US. And with a private um, system owned uh, by the top, let's say, 20 banks in the U.S., the clearinghouse, and with a central bank-owned system for clearing and settlement uh, owned by the Federal Reserve, we do have sort of fundamentally different philosophies. And I don't know that it was common knowledge before Sam said it, but there's two ACH systems, right? Nobody ever talks about that because it's just existed for a really long time. I don't know, maybe 50 years ago when they launched ACH, it was newsworthy. So the fact that we have two different faster payment systems and the big banks are not on Fed now is a bit like saying I'm a shareholder of a given company and thus I'm going to shop more often at that store and buy goods and services. Like some friends of mine, you know, are big into electric vehicles and so they're Rivian shareholders and they drive a Rivian and you know, they're very dedicated to their cause. I think about that in terms of like who owns the clearinghouse. And what motivation do they have to add the sort of competitive network that effectively functions the same? They don't have a lot of real incentive because they have a mechanism for sending payments. What they don't have is the full reach. So in order for us to get to complete ubiquity, 
I think where big banks who own the clearinghouse decide to stop their, let's say, connection to new payment systems, you're inevitably going to need technology solutions to bring that next wave. And that could be everything from FedNow to things yet to be created, right? I hope that FedNow isn't the last innovation in the portfolio of rails that we're going to offer in the U.S. I think it's just a similar innovation to one that goes alongside with something that the bigger banks already built, own, and feel that they don't need to do more work around. And so it always comes back to me in financial services to technology being the uniting factor that's going to streamline and smooth out the imperfection so that businesses and consumers never have to think about what's under the surface from an infrastructure perspective. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Sam, given it was your point at the start of the show about this like public-private divide, I suppose it feels fair to get your take on this as well. Like, Do you think big banks not being part of this network is going to hold back some of the things you were talking about as aspirations? I... It's a really good question, Kate. I'm not sure. I, I really, it's it's a difficult question to answer because I think what we're saying is that the big banks don't support it right now. And a few banks, I mean, some of the big banks support both for sure. But I think if we have this conversation, Kate, a year from now, I think we're going to see a lot more of those big banks choosing to support both rails and that this will kind of be a, a moot point in the future. I think one of the interesting things about there being two ACH systems, but no one knows about it, is because we paper over it intentionally. You know, NACHA has, is this organization to combine these two systems under a common framework so that people don't have to think about the two technology differences. That hasn't occurred for RTP and FedNow, but the feature set for both is almost exactly identical. Uh, there's differences in how they implement, there's differences in who owns them, of course, but the feature set, at least for the end business or the end consumer, are you know, almost indistinguishable. But we don't have the benefit of having them interoperate and federate together. And so I think one of the things that's still on the table for either of these systems is getting more features, developing more features that are actually used that might tip the scales one direction or the other. I mean, I usually I say payment systems don't die, but this is the one instance where I think RTP FedNow could potentially be Blu-ray HD DVD, which is two competing formats coming out around the same time. One takes precedence over the other over, you know, six, seven years after developing better relationships, more distribution, better features. And some of those features were, and I know this sounds weird in 2024, 3D, which was a big thing, you know, back then was like having, you know, 3D Blu-rays. I think we could start to see the equivalent for FedNow or RTP being things like structured remittance information, potentially an identity layer, the way Zell has. There's all these potential innovations that I think could tip the scales in one direction or the other. But right now we have two identical systems. I don't see any reason why the banks wouldn't adopt both unless there becomes a you know, fundamental difference or change between the two that makes one purely superior over the other. Uh, it's too early to know for either, but yeah. Very, very interesting times we have. Stephanie, which which features are you most most hoping to see? Well, Sam actually mentioned one that I'm very intrigued by, which is remittance data. So I think if you unpack, without getting too technical, what makes these push payment systems work in the US, it's a new ISO standard, ISO 2022, and it's a messaging layer. And so if you think about um, something like, let's say, ACH, you send the payment, in a file and there's some data that maybe comes later and there's a lot of swapping of information, even probably people picking up the phone still to verify what's going on. So it's a very manual process. With ISO and this new messaging layer that goes with FedNow, RTP, and it's where the Fed's taking FedWire, you have the ability to embed information into the transaction, not just characters, but attached PDF files and remittance data. So I think we're just honestly at such early innings of being like, it goes fast. It's instant. That's great. Those are awesome benefits. It goes 24-7, 365, also incredible. Now it's about figuring out at the sort of next level with the technology capability, what could be true in financial services that's not true today. And I think for us, when I think about what we've done at Orem, you know, last um, October, we launched an instant bank account verification tool that we literally built on top of the messaging framework for FedNow and RTP. And that's the first of its kind innovation to not just say, let's move money faster, but let's take advantage of something underneath the technology layer so that we can innovate. And so with the launch of FedNow, 
we were able to build a new technology that leverages the payment rails messaging system and we can get real-time account information um, to different businesses about what's going on with that account in a way that realistically was like nothing like that before in the market, right? And so I just think these are examples of things where when we think about the future payments and we start to think about the sophistication and complexity where otherwise software had to get built to solve a problem, it's entirely possible that with the existing infrastructure that goes with push payments and what I think someday will be request for pay, which is in the ecosystem of Fed now, we're going to have a fundamentally different ability to transact with rich data. One of the reasons why Americans like credit cards, setting aside that it gets you at rewards, is that when you swipe and you walk out of Starbucks, the merchant had a handshake with your acquiring bank, and they know that Stephanie's good for the $5. They're going to get the settlement later, but they get the promise to pay, and they get all the data instantaneously. That, if you translate it to bank transfer payments, which is $80 trillion of money movement just on the ACH alone, that unlock of payment certainty is where I think we're going to have the most innovation in the years to come, both to fight fraud, as Dave mentioned, we're likely to see with push payments, and I have already seen with things like Zelle, but also to create incredibly strong capabilities to have more information about the account who we're transacting with, and to have the information about what's going on in the transaction be streamlined into the process itself. So I just can't wait. I mean, like I said, I'm so happy that it's here. It moves money instantly. I love all those use cases, but I just think the most interesting pieces are still to come. Yeah, no, absolutely. You definitely, I mean, again, I'm, I'm sure it's coming across on in your voice for like listeners, right? But I can see just kind of by like how you're expressing it, like how, how exciting it is kind of for you and kind of where you're sat. Um, Dave, I suppose you know, one of the criticisms we had in the first half of the show was you know, potentially seeing the US as being a very slow mover compared to other markets. I guess hopefully one of the benefits of doing this later is you can see from other countries who've rolled out similar systems what's worked and what hasn't worked. Do you see any evidence of that in the way that FedNow has been designed? Do you think FedNow will have the opportunities to do things that maybe other payments networks designed earlier won't be able to do? Yeah, you know, if you look, there's a lot of payments that that's sort of moving towards standardised messaging now. You know, ISO 22022 is is the fundamental at the heart of so many things. The fact that FedNow is on that, FedWire is moving to that, SWIFT is on that, and so many things. And, and, but if you look at what was, if you went backwards to faster payments in the UK, that isn't using things like that. So, the, you know, one of the big advantages I think for for where Fed now is 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 the ability I think in the future for much more interoperability between these different different systems because of the way that they've all been built on a, on a very similar messaging standard, and and so I think that gives it a lot of power of things that it, that we just don't simply have in in Europe because a lot of things aren't standardised in in the same way um, to the same same level um, you know that the standards within particular rails in in SEPA, in faster payments, in it, but there's not cross network interoperability built into some of those things that could easily be be something that that, that extends into what's there with FedNow. And I suppose to someone that's, again, not in payments, can you, can you just explain to them what that messaging standardization, what does that mean? What, what impact does that have? Like, if you scratch beneath the surface? They're all talking the same language effectively. Whereas, you know, you know if, you, if you were to take you know, SEPA for payments across Europe, for um, the Euro world and, and faster payments in, in the UK, they, they speak different languages. They can't talk to each other. Whereas if you have the same messaging standard, you know, you understand the messages and you can you can put gateways between them and they can interoperate in, in a much easier way because you're not having to translate between the two. Awesome. No, thank you. Um, Sam, what, what are you most excited about? If we were to kind of come back in five years' time, and have the same conversation, where would you love FedNow to be? I would love FedNow to be obviously more ubiquitous. I'd like there to be more banks offering FedNow. Um, but I would really love for the ability to initiate a FedNow payment. I would love for the ability as a consumer to be able to go in, initiate a FedNow payment, and have that just go to whoever my recipient is. Um, and to kind of further echo what Stephanie and Dave are saying, I'd love to see some kind of you know structured remittance information power that I just don't have today in my bank. You know, if I if I do 
pay for something with ACH, I, if I look at my bank account, I usually see this, you know, gobbledygook description of what this payment is for with all these identifiers that make no sense. And if I was a robot, I could easily decipher it, but I'm a human. And so if I see the word Venmo or American Express, okay, I know what this payment was for, but I'd love to see my receipt. I, I would actually love to be in the world that Stephanie describes, but a little bit further, which is I go to Starbucks, I pay with FedNow, perhaps by scanning a QR code, and the receipt for my Starbucks is sent through the network. And that's something that I think is missing in cards, missing in all payment networks, is why don't I have my receipt in my banking portal? Why can't I see that I got a hot chocolate with whipped cream, my drink of choice? Uh, why don't I see that in my, my account when I look into what this you know, $5 charge was for? And I think it's, and, and this is maybe me pontificating, I think it's insane that we in 2024 around the world don't have that capability. Instead, I have to either go to my Starbucks app or I got an email from the merchant with my receipt. So I have clearly the capabilities exist to send me this information out of band. Why isn't that context, that message stapled to the payment rail that I paid with? Uh, it just, it, it makes no sense to me. And so five years from now, I'd love to see that world starting to take place. You know, it's not going to happen overnight, but I'd love to see this take the first step down that road. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've seen a couple of fintechs that have tried to move into that space, right, of providing that receipt level data. But it feels, yeah, as you said, like the real needed outstanding, like industry level change that is needed. So it feels like it needs a big boy or big girl like Fed now to, to kind of take it on potentially to, to maybe push that through. That would be so awesome. Um, Dave, hopefully we're still friends in five years time. Uh, if we have a chat, if we have a chat again about Fed now five years time, what would you what would you love to have seen? I think seeing the adoption is is fundamental to, to this and making sure that it, it keeps going through the numbers because, um, you know, that that's what will make the difference. But actually really putting some, the power of this in the hands of the consumers is fundamental to make it succeed because it stops it being a technology play under the covers and actually something that, that people care about from a, an end user and end consumer perspective because that will that will force it to, to happen and i think that for me is 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 what we need to see happen over the next few years is to really move it up to start to show capabilities that that are making a difference to people's lives in in, in the way that they're they're seeing and it isn't just a, and for me it's not just about it being instant, it's what else it can provide that, that helps around that. Um, whether that's, you know, embedding identity in it to make, to reduce fraud and, and risk around fraud of who you're paying to, or, or whether it, it's, it's things like Sam have talked about of, of embedding other enriched things in, in the transactions. Those are the things for me that will actually make it, it win because consumers will go, I want to use this because actually I get all of this value from it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Stephanie, I guess final. Final word, final prediction to you, I guess. What would you love to see in five years' time? Well, in five years' time, I'd love us all to be saying, much like when people get married, why did we wait so long, right? This is amazing. I think we're going to continue to realize benefits um, month over month, year over year. And I envision, much like Dave and Sam, lots of differences in how consumers and businesses interact with payments. And I think really specifically, kind of coming back to Dave's point, I envision that there's going to be a lot more willingness and um, capabilities built around biometrics being built into the push payment ecosystem so that we feel certain. I just think you can have payment speed all day long and it's amazing, but it only works if, if you have payment certainty. And it's why we're spending so much time at Orem thinking about products like Verify and the next generation of that solution, which is going to continue to map to making sure that it is the right person at the right time before you transact, not after. And I think we're going to be able to say in five years, we've, we've mastered that in a way that today you look ahead and feel worried about where fraud's going. And so I think it's just exciting times all around for tons of capabilities and willingness to put in a little more effort as a consumer or business before doing a payment so that there's certainty and far less fraud in the system than there is today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think, yeah, as we've covered across this whole conversation, it feels like there is a ton of opportunity both like for you fed now just in terms of what it is and what it builds itself, but also for what organizations like Aurum, like Modern Treasury, can build on top of or around it as well. So 
a super exciting development and we will absolutely keep an eye on it as as it continues to, to develop. So sadly, that wraps up today's discussion. We probably could have talked about this all day, um, but thank you so much for joining me. Where can people find out more about you and kind of what you're focusing on, Dave? Uh, from LinkedIn or across all of the, the content on 11FS. Awesome. Stephanie? Find me on LinkedIn. You can find our website at orum.io and you can email us at hello at orum.io. Brilliant. And Sam, what about you? You can also find me on LinkedIn, but also at moderntreasury.com at our journal where I write a lot of our blog posts. Love a journal. Uh, and you can find me also on LinkedIn. Uh, sorry, getting a bit repetitive now. Apologies. Uh, Kate Moody on LinkedIn or kateoutlandinvest.com. Thank you so much for listening. I um, hope you've learned as much as I have today. If you like what you've heard, follow our podcast. Don't forget to leave us a review. It helps us to make the show better and helps others to find us too. As always, if you want to join the conversation, find us on social media. Just search for 11FS or Fintech Insider or email podcasts at 11FS.com. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Keeping up with all the noise and news from the world of financial services isn't easy. It's easy to get lost in buzzwords, jargon, and industry speak. So sometimes you just need a quick human rundown of the biggest stories. Well, you are in luck. Bite-sized is our very own weekly newsletter that takes the biggest news stories from financial services and tells you exactly what's happening, why it matters, and what comes next. Bite Size goes out every Friday at 11am, so you can enjoy it with a coffee as you wrap up your week. Stay up to speed with the fast-moving world of financial services and subscribe today at 11fs.com forward slash newsletters. That's 11fs.com forward slash newsletters. <laughs>